BigTalkForYou.com or the BigTalkForYou.com at gmail.com. So, uh, you know, we're going to get this thing started, guys. Let me see my, oh, yeah, my special guest is here. There we go. We're going to get this thing started now. So my special guest, you can actually uh, check him out on YouTube. You can type in the search box on YouTube, Yase777. He has a hot Hebrew-Israelite animated cartoon out there right now called Little Little Isaac. Like I said, the brother got me checking out the cartoons now. It's a very powerful message. You know, again, it's for the kids, for the adults, and, uh, and every cartoon episode has a strong message behind it. So I highly recommend that you go to his YouTube channel. Again, it's Yah Saves 777. He's the founder of the Hand of Yah Ministries. This is my brother, Brother Jason. Welcome to the show. Shalom, shalom, Brother Sal. How you doing, brother? I'm doing pretty good, man. Welcome to the show, man. Anything you want to put out there, any information before we begin the class, you can go ahead. Um, no, I, I think you pretty much covered it, brother. Um, you know, I think that since the last time we spoke, since the last time I was on, uh, I put out about three more episodes, you know, of uh, the Little Isaac animation, and, you know, I'm getting a lot of good positive feedback, you know, from, the, uh, from those uh, episodes that I've been putting out, and you know, a lot of people are saying, you know, they're watching it with their children and their, their children are learning, you know, as a result of it. So, you know, that's just that's just an incredible, you know, blessing, you know, just to know that, you know, the young ones are, you know, gaining from this. So, you know, just thanking you, you know, for just using me as a vessel just to put that out there. And, you know, I still got the T-shirt ministry going on for those that are interested in, you know, getting the uh, Yasses T-shirt. You know, just hit me up on you know, email, and uh, I'll be sure to get, you know, those shirts out to you. Yeah, once again, guys, I have to actually, this, in the description box, I have the YouTube channel. And uh, later on, I'll probably, uh, do you have, like, a website for the T-shirts or, or email that you want to put out there? If people want the uh, Yasin's no, uh, T-shirts? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I still don't uh, have a, a website up as yet, but if uh, you want to email me, you can reach me uh, at uh, love Torah 777 That's love. Tora T O R A H and then seven 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 at gmail dot com. Uh, now, now before we get to class, I want to ask you a question about the little Isaac. You know, that's my favorite cartoon. There, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite cartoon on YouTube. Now, how long does it take for you to actually put that together? How does how long does it take for you to uh, set that up by uh, episode? Well, um, you know, I'm I'm a working man. You know, I got full time job, so you know. Uh, you know, every little moment I can steal away, that you know, uh, and I got family and kids too, so you know that takes up a lot of my time. So every little moment that I can, I can steal away and work on it, I do. And I think, uh, you know, on average, I've been coming out with episodes every two to three weeks. You know, so that can kind of give you an idea. You know that uh, it, it's definitely a labor of love, brother Sal. <laughs> You know, I never. If you told me I'd be doing, I was be doing this maybe two or three years ago, I would have said, Nah, man, whatever. You know, but uh, you know, it's definitely a, a labor of love, and uh, I enjoy doing it. And uh, you know, I'm just glad that it's uh, blessing a lot of people out there. Right, guys, so we're going to get this thing started. And once again, the number is 646-716-7320. By the way, the chat room is officially open, guys. It's working today. <laughs> we had some technical difficulties for the first episode, but it's definitely working today. So you can always go to the Blog Talk Radio website and interact with me or anybody that's inside the chat room. You can even relay your questions inside the chat room, and I'll read it out loud to my special guests. If you have any questions, you know, because some people are shy. They don't want to call in. So that's another alternative. You can just type them in in the chat room or send me an email at the Bay Talk you at gmail.com, and then I'll read about the questions out to my special guests. But let's get this class started. Again, it's called Jesus, the Modern Day Golden Calf. Brother Jason, go ahead. Praise Yahuwah. I just want to give all thanks first and foremost to Yahuwah, uh, my Redeemer, uh, my everything, you know, for allowing me, just giving breath in my body just to be here and just to uh, present this class to you all. Uh, once again, thanks to South Showtime for bringing me back on the show for season six. And I want to thank you, the listening audience, for taking time out of your busy schedule just to listen in tonight uh, to a show that I I pray will be very um, edifying to the body of Messiah and eye-opening to those who have yet to enter into Yahuwah's covenant. Um, As usual, I just want to open up in a a quick word of prayer. Um, Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Abba Yahuwah, 
just want to thank you once more, Father, for this opportunity uh, to share in your word with your people. And I pray, Father, that uh, this message will reach those who you intended to reach and it will touch uh, the hearts of your children. I uh, want to thank you once more for everything that you've done and the sacrifice that was made uh, at Golgotha so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. There's none like you. You alone are Yahuwah Elohim. And I do thank you, Father, for everything that you've done and all that you're going to do. And uh, we look forward to the day when we'll be reunified as one in your kingdom. In Yahushua's name, I pray. Amen. Tonight's lesson is entitled, Jesus, the Modern Day Golden Calf. Now, at the onset, the title may imply that I'm going to be presenting a lesson that speaks against the Messiah of the New Testament, or that I'm coming with some sort of non-Messianic approach. But those of you that know who I am and who know who and what I'm about will know that nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, uh, as Sal had stated earlier, um, there was a panel discussion several weeks ago right here on debate talk for you entitled messianic or non-messianic which shall you choose and i had the the privilege and uh pleasure of being on that panel and i was one of the panelists that was on the messianic side uh, supporting the position that hebrews should follow the mashiach of the new testament so what in the world am i doing teaching a lesson entitled jesus the modern day golden calf well, I believe Yahuwah has laid this lesson on my heart because it's very important that as we strive as a people to live a set-apart lifestyle, we must always bear in mind that Yahuwah must be set apart as well. So please listen keenly to the following statement that I'm going to make. The true Messiah, the true Mashiach of Yahshua'al is Yahushua. Now, when I first came into the knowledge of my Hebrew roots, I would use the name of Yahushua and the anglicized false name of Jesus interchangeably. But as I've grown as a believer, I've grown to appreciate that Jesus and Yahushua are not only two different names, but they are two different and distinct personalities. And the sad reality is many brothers and sisters in this Hebraic walk end up turning away from the Messiah of the New Testament or the Renewed Covenant because their concept of the Messiah is framed and fixed around the Christian Jesus. And so they end up throwing out the Messiah of the New Testament altogether and rejecting the New Testament as the authoritative word of Yahuwah. It's my prayer that at the end of this lesson, you will understand that the New Testament and the Messiah of the New Testament are true. But just like the heathens attached false names and titles to our Father in the Tanakh, or what is commonly called the Old Testament, you must understand that they did the same thing to the Son of the New Testament. And you'll come to understand why it's not okay to refer to Jesus and Yahushua interchangeably, like you're speaking of the same person. Because in reality, debate talk to you audience they are not the same person turn with me to the book of Hazun or Revelation chapter 12 and we're just going to look at verse 9 because there we are given a warning there it reads and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceives the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his messengers were cast out with him. So you see, Satan has deceived the entire world, and he's gotten a large portion of the world to accept the modern day golden calf. Now I'm going to make another statement that may offend many when I say this, but as you if you can bear it and listen into the rest of the lesson, you'll see where I'm coming from. Jesus Christ also known as Jesus Christos, is a false Messiah. The true Messiah is the Hebrew Mashiach of Yahshua'el, and that is the person of Yahushua ben Elohim. Now, before we get 
into the meat of this lesson, I want to serve you up an appetizer. Because we must have an understanding that our Heavenly Father, Yahuwah, is Kadosh. Most of us that are used to being in the church would say the word holy. But the Hebraic term is Kadosh, which means set apart. And in the book of Aikra or Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, there it reads, I am Yahuwah Eloecha. Therefore, sanctify yourselves and ye shall be set apart, for I am set apart. So before we get into the whole incident with the golden calf, which we're going to study tonight, it's important that we understand what it means to be kadosh and to set Yahuwah apart. Let us look in the book of Numbers, chapter 20. Numbers, chapter 20, and we're just going to read the first 12 verses, it says there, And the children of Yashorel, all the congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month. And the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled against Moshe, or Moses, and against Aharon. And the people contended with Moshe and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brothers died before Yahuwah. Why have you brought up the assembly of Yahuwah into this wilderness, that we and our livestock should die here? And why have you brought us up out of Mitzrayim, or Egypt, to bring us to this evil place? Not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moshe and Aharon went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tent of meeting, and they fell on their faces. And the esteem of Yahuwah appeared to them, and Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, Take the rod and assemble the congregation, you and your brother Aharon, and you shall speak to the rock before their eyes, and it shall give its water. And you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their livestock. And Moshe took the rod from before Yahuwah as he commanded him. And Moshe and Aharon assembled the assembly before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moshe lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and much water came out, and the congregation and their livestock drank. But Yahuwah spoke to Moshe and to Aharon, and he said, Because you did not believe me to set me apart in the eyes of the children of Yashraya, therefore you do not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Now when we read that account, we see that Yahuwah was upset with Moshe because he told him to speak to the rock. But instead of speaking to the rock, he struck it with the rod. And many of us would think, well, why was Yahuwah so upset over this? Why, why, you know, why did Moshe have to pay the penalty of not being able to enter into the promised land because of this? Well, that's because Moshe or Moses' sin of striking the rock misrepresented the very character of Almighty Yah. Supposed to be a show of love and Yahuwah's mercy became a display of anger and wrath. We see how he spoke to the children of Yahshua. Moshe called them rebels and he was upset with them and their grumbling. But Yahuwah, our Heavenly Father, he wants to draw us into a relationship of love. It's not his goal to scare and condemn us away. So we see that this was a serious sin that ended up disqualifying Moses from entering the promised land. And Yahuwah said, you failed to set me apart. We must understand that the children of Yashara were coming out of a polytheistic system in Egypt, where they were surrounded by many gods of wood and stone. And all of these false idols and the stories that were associated with them made these gods seem so remote and distant from humanity. The relationship with the peop- that, that the people had with these gods was one of coercion. But Yahuwah, our Heavenly Father, has always desired a close and intimate relationship with his people based off of love, not coercion. He's not interested, Yashrael, in us being puppets. He wants us to come to him in love from a pure heart. So even though Moses, Moshe, mischaracterized Yahuwah, 
Yahuwah in his mercy still allowed the water to come from the rock. And on a mystery and sword level, this water coming from the rock is a picture of what we see in Yahukanan or John chapter 19, verse 34, when we see that Yahushua's side was speared and water came out. Despite Moshe's mistake, despite the sins of the people and their constant grumbling, we see that Yahuwah is merciful and that he does care about his people. So I begin with that account to show you, Yashra, the importance of setting Yahuwah apart. He's not to be mischaracterized or mistaken with any of the false mighty ones of Egypt because Yahuwah is al Elyon, the Most High El. And just like he doesn't want to be likened to any of these false gods of Egypt. He doesn't want to be mischaracterized with the gods of this modern Egypt that we're in, the United States of America. Yahuwah is not like the Baptist God. He's not like the Catholic God. He's nothing like the Mighty One of Mormonism. And he's nothing like the Pentecostals Christ. He is not like the Jesus of Christianity or that blasphemous image associated with the Jesus of Christianity. He's nothing like Allah, and he's far from Buddha. So with that basis, knowing that Yahuwah is set apart, and he alone is Elohim, let us get into the meat of this study, and let us turn to the book of Shemot, or Exodus chapter 32. There we see that when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aharon and said unto him, Up, make us mighty ones which shall go before us. For as far for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what has become of him. And Aharon said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the gold earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aharon. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. Let's stop right there. And let's just reflect on these four verses. Moshe, or Moses, went up into the mount to receive instructions from Yahuwah. And because he delayed returning to the people, the people were growing impatient and fearful. Now, I want to ask you, debate talk for you, audience. What does this sound like to you? Are not people growing impatient and fearful in this time because they, the Messiah has yet to return? You hear a lot of people say it's been almost 2,000 years and he still hasn't come. It is this state of fear and impatience that breeds idolatry. It breeds that need for a quick fix. And the scriptures make it clear in 1 John or 1 Yehuchanan, chapter 4, verse 18, that there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Because fear hath torment. And he that fears is not made perfect in love. You see, when you have that deep-rooted love for Yahuwah in your heart, there's no room for fear to dwell in your heart. Fear is that one emotion that can be linked to most of humanity's miseries. Because what does fear bring about? It brings about mistrust. Now, get this picture in your head. Think about a, a father teaching his son or daughter to swim. That young child initially is fearful, and the father has to bring reassurance to the child, saying, I'm not going to let you drown. It's okay. You're going to be all right. And eventually, one of two things will happen. Either that child will remain in a state of fear and won't learn, or that child will relax and trust her father. And before long, we'll be swimming up and down in that pool like it's nobody's business. This is the same as our relationship with the Almighty Yah. Perfect love casts out all fear. We trust his word because it is what he has told us. He has told us that he'll be coming back for us. And our hope rests in that. But we see in this scripture in 1 John, that fear has torment. Now, the Greek word there for torment is kolosim, and it is equivalent to the idea of being punished. 
when that fear rises up in you, it makes you feel like you're being punished. And the children of Yashroel were allowing this fear to rise up in their hearts. And they felt like perhaps they were brought out into the wilderness to die. And somehow they were being punished by the Most High. We see that many times in their wilderness journey. Let's turn real quickly to the book of Shemot or Exodus chapter 14. And we're just going to look at three short verses. Exodus chapter 14, 11 through 14. There it says, And they said to Moshe, Did you take us away to die in the wilderness because there are no graves in Egypt? What is this you have done to us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone and let us serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the deliverance of Yahuwah, which he does for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you are never never to see again. Yahuwah does fight for you. And you, Yashrael, sometimes we need to just keep still and keep silent. Like the scripture says, we need to be still and know that he is Allahim. We need to meditate on his word and allow his peace or shalom to wash over us. Let us turn back to Shemot or Exodus chapter 32. Because in this story or account of the golden calf, Aaron is often blamed for his weak leadership. And sadly, that is what we see in the Christian world today. There are a lot of leaders who can speak well. They have fancy suits, nice cars, flashy smiles, and not much else. You see, Aaron bent to the will of the people instead of bending to the will of Yahuwah. And that is precisely what is happening today. The so-called pastors reverends, bishops, people pleasers. And we are told in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 3, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heat to themselves, teachers having itching ears. All around us, that very thing is happening, which is further proof that the renewed covenant writings in the New Testament are true. Because we see it coming to pass all around us. These so-called pastors, reverends, bishops, they're telling the people what they want to hear. They're presenting a feel-good gospel, a quick-fix gospel. And all you have to do is just send in your love offering, and all your problems will disappear. They'll point to Sister Jones over there and say, see, she got healing, or now she's dead. Meanwhile, Sister Jones is really an actor that got paid off by the ministry. In verse 3 of Exodus chapter 32, it says, And all the people broke off their golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aharon. You see, the people were obedient to Aharon and did what he asked. And that's just like today. People will bring their money every Sunday and their tithes. They'll make that sacrifice as long as the preacher or pastor presents to them a god that will satisfy their flesh, that will satisfy their mind, as long as that God makes them feel good and comfortable with their sin, comfortable with their Torahlessness. Verse 4 says, And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, This is your mighty one, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to Yahuwah. And they rose up early in the morning and offered burnt sacrifices and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Now some translations will say, These be thy gods, O Israel. But in the Hebrew, it says Alueka, which is translated your Alua, or your mighty one. Aaron didn't make two or three calves. It was one golden calf. So he is showing the people the visual rep- representation of the almighty one that rescued them from their bondage in Egypt. 
Now, there are a few things we need to understand from this that will show you the parallels between the golden calf and the false Jesus Christ. The Hebrew word for calf is the Strong's number 5695, Miguel, and it means just that. It means a calf. And a calf is the young of a domestic animal, such as a bull. So Aaron did not make an adult bull. What he made was a young calf. And the young calf became the embodiment of the adult bull, just like Jesus the Son is the embodiment of the Almighty Father. Now, if they were worshiping an Egyptian deity, they would have referred to this calf as Apis, which is the name of the Egyptian bull god. But if you notice, they didn't do that. They did something much worse. Aaron, when referring to this young calf, called it Yahuwah. Because we see in the text, Aaron made the proclamation, tomorrow is a feast to Yahuwah. So what's taking place here, debate, talk to you audience, is something called syncretism. Syncretism is the blending of different and often contrary beliefs. Aaron took the holy and set apart name of Yahuwah and attached it to this object that they had made and they had proclaimed a false feast day. Syncretism is a very dangerous practice because it blends the truth with a lie. And what we see taking place in the modern day Christian church is no different. Please understand the truth is there is a son who came and lived amongst humanity and died for the sins of his people. But sadly, the church has taken the Messiah, the son of the Most High, and they've attached a false name. They've attached false images. They've attached the false Sabbath and false feast to him. The false name that they've attached is the name Jesus. I walked this earth, he was never called that name. I implore you to do your own independent research, and you will see that the letter J or J sound never even existed before 400 years ago. They've attached a false image to this Jesus. And the Roman Catholic Church has done the job of spreading this false image of a lily, white, long, straight haired Jesus all over the world. And most Protestant churches have followed suit by continuing to promote this false image. They have also attached a false Sabbath. Sunday is not the Sabbath day. And they proclaim false feasts that have nothing to do with the true Father and Son. Christmas is one of those false feasts that originated in Babylon and over time became popular and called many different names by many different pagan cultures around the world. Just look up the names uh, Yule and Saturnalia. Again, if you're hearing this for the first time, I encourage you, or I challenge you even, to do your own research and be in much prayer about the things that I'm saying. Now, with the work that I get to do, I get to go into a lot of people's homes. And just a few weeks ago, I was in the home of one of my clients. And as I entered her house, the very first thing my eyes rested on was a sacred heart picture of Jesus. And if anyone knows about this famous Catholic portrait of Jesus, they know what I'm talking about. The open Bibles in this lady's home and different religious items she had hung up on her wall immediately indicated to me that this lady was a Catholic. But as my visit went on, I learned this lady was no longer a practicing Catholic, but was now attending a non-denominational church and had been for several years. However, despite that change, she still continued to keep these false pictures all over her home. And at one point during our meeting, the lady recalled to me how she had a near-death experience And wouldn't you know, she pointed to the sacred heart picture of Jesus and she said, he was not ready for me yet. Remember that scripture I read at the beginning in the book of Revelation. It said, Satan, which deceives the whole world. He has deceived not only this little old lady, folks, but he has managed to deceive billions of people. Not only in this day, 
but throughout the past centuries as well. And he's deceived them into believing this image as representing the son of the Almighty, the modern-day golden calf with his golden locks of hair. Let us continue in Shemot, or Exodus 32. Now we're at verse 7. There it says, And Yahuwah said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Now the Hebrew word for corrupted there is the word shachat, and it means to cause, to ruin, or to destroy. And the Hebrew word picture is very telling, because the first letter is the letter shin which is a picture of something that consumes, like fire. The second letter is the chet, and it's a picture of a fence. In this instance, the fence can be likened to the Torah of Yahuwah. Folks, the Torah of Yahuwah, or law of Yahuwah, is designed not to keep you from having fun and enjoying life. It's there to protect you. And the final letter is the ta, the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And in the uh, old-fashioned Hebrew, it's a picture of two sticks that are joined, symbolizing covenant relationship. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, this Hebrew word picture tells us a destructive fire that is destroying the fence or the Torah and threatening the covenant relationship. And isn't that indeed what we saw happening at Horeb? The people's disobedience was that fire that did violence to the Torah of Almighty Yahuwah. And now the relationship that Yahuwah was attempting to establish with his people was being threatened. In verse 8 of chapter 32, it says, They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. Now in this verse, I want us to put our focus on that word way. In Yahukanon or John 14, 6, Yahushua declares, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. This was the way that he commanded to the children of Yashorel. Because the written Torah and the living Torah are one and the same. And the Hebrew word for way here is very interesting. It is the word derek, which again consists of three Hebrew letters. The Dalit, the Resh, and the Kaf. The Dalit is a picture of a tent door. And the next letter is the Resh, which is the pictograph Hebrew. In the pictograph Hebrew is the head of a man. And finally, the Kaf is a picture of an open hand. All of these pictures point to our Messiah and what he represents to us. First of all, the door. In Yehukanan or John 10, 9, Yehushua declares, I am the door. By me, if any man enters in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The resh is the head of a man. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, the apostle Shaul or Paul writes, but I want you to realize that the head of every man is Messiah. And finally, the cough, the open hand, becomes an invitation to take the hand of the Messiah and allow him to guide you in this life. This is what we get with the Hebrew word derek, a door which opens up to the head of our lives, Messiah, with his hands extended, saying, take my hand, I'll lead you the rest of the way. So we can begin to see the problem with the idolatry that was taking place there at the foot of the mountain. The children of Yashrael chose another door. They chose another head of their lives. In our time, some have chosen Muhammad. Some have chosen Buddha. A lot have chosen Jesus. They have placed their lives in the hand of another. They turned aside from the way, the truth, and the life. And now they've accepted a false way, a lie, and death. This is what happens when you reject the way, the truth, and the life. You get a false way, you get a lie, and ultimately, you get death. The scriptures declare in Mishli or Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Millions upon millions of Christians go to church every Sunday and they're doing something that seems right. Maybe their grandmother taught them that 
Christianity was right, or the preacher man or a priest told them that it was right. And so in their eyes, it seems right. And this has occurred time and time again in the history of our people, Yahshua. When are we going to learn? During the time of the judges, we see in Judges chapter 21, verse 25, it says there, in those days, there was no king in Yahshua. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And the text says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. But the sad reality is, they didn't recognize that they did have a king. And that king is Yahuwah. And if they had just turned to him, they would do what was right and do what was right, which is follow his Torah. But instead, they did what was right in their own eyes. So I ask you, audience, does that not sound like what's going on with our people today? Some will cling to Islam. Some will cling to the New Age. Some will cling to Egyptology. But most will cling to Christianity. And everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. If it appeases the eye, then it must be right, right? We remember Hawa or Eve in the garden. That food on that tree was pleasing to the eyes. It was desirable. But Christianity is desirable here in this country because it's the main religion here. So you tell people that you're a Christian, guess what? You fit right in. In Christianity, you dedicate maybe an hour or two every Sunday, you pay your tithes, and you've done your good Christian service. You see, it's desirable, it's easy, it's appeasing to the flesh. But now try walking as Yahuwah commands, the true walk, the true way. That's not so appeasing to the flesh. And it's not so desirable to the eyes because it's a road less traveled. And in fact, the religions of this world, they represent that broad way to destruction that Yahushua talks about in the renewed covenant writings. While the true way of life is likened like unto a small dirt path, a narrow way that few men find. The golden calf seemed right to the children of Yashrael. Here they were in the middle of nowhere. Their leader Moses was nowhere to be found. So they felt like they were sitting ducks. They started to have that fear rise up in their hearts, and they were thinking, what if they got attacked by one of those nations around them? These nations would would question who was their mighty one that went before them. You see, the other nations, they had Osiris, Dagon, Molech. So who would be the mighty one of Yashorah? Well, the golden calf became the answer to these questions. And after Aharon put that calf together and and made that calf, the way the sun just glistened on that gold of that calf was desirable and pleasant to the eyes. And now they would thought in their hearts, their children would now have a tangible object that they could adore, a visual aid, if you will. And despite all the wondrous works that Yahuwah performed to bring them out from under the Pharaoh, somewhere in the recesses of their subconscious was all the idolatry they had just come out of. The pomp and the majesty of Egypt that was associated with this idolatry was very appealing. But how soon they forgot that Pharaoh and his army were now buried underneath the Red Sea. You see, the audience, the the pomp and the majesty of America is no different. With all the splendor of the large megachurches and cathedrals that we see across this nation, and that we see on any given Sunday, these places are packed with worshipers and people giving their adoration to the modern golden calf, a substitute Messiah, a substitute deliverer, a substitute savior. The verses that we read said that our forefathers quickly went out of the way. Just as soon as they had gotten their deliverance from slavery, and from the Egypt, the bondage that they were under, how quickly they went out of the way and started worshiping this false idol. So I ask you, if our forefathers could quickly go out of the way of life, what do you think has happened over the course of almost 2,000 years? There's an old saying, and I hope 
those that are paying attention will write this down. Time is the ally of deceit. I'll repeat that. Time is the ally of deceit. And sadly, this idolatrous image and false name seems right to so many. But we're reminded the end of this false way is death. Now, when we read the rest of verse 8, it says they, they, made the, they have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed it unto it and said, This is your Alua, O Yahshua, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. These words that we just read will basically take up a good portion of the rest of this study because now we've gotten to the heart of the matter of Yahshua's idolatry. The golden calf represents the image of the invisible Elohim. And as I stated earlier, it's a calf because it represents the young of the bull. In this instance, it represents the son of the Most High Elohim. Why was it a calf? Well, when we do the research, we see that the people of the ancient Near East Mesopotamia, Syria, Phoenicia, Canaan, Egypt, they greatly admired the strength and power of mighty wild bulls. And therefore, in metaphorical language, they likened their gods and goddesses to these animals. They also likened their kings, queens, princes, and princesses to these animals as well. And if you observe ancient pictographs and relics, of these false gods, you'll see that their crowns or helmets often consisted of multiple layers of bull's horns. And even in our modern day, we see this Baphomet image with the horns that many people uh, in Hollywood will adorn themselves with. So the calf, the young of a bull, becomes an extension of the strength, of the life, of the fertility of the adult bull. And archaeologists, they found in Iron Age Samaria an ostraka or potsherd with these words inscribed, Egel Yah, Egel Yah, which means bull, calf, Yah, which suggests what we already know from reading this text that Yahuwah was worshipped as a golden calf by Israel. Now, I want to say this. When you start studying the Hebrew, and I encourage Hebrew literacy because it really brings out, you know, a lot more from the text, from the scriptures, when we can know the Hebrew behind the scriptures. When you start studying that Hebrew Aleph Bet, you'll notice that the first letter, the Aleph, in the pictographic Hebrew, is a picture of an ox or bull's head. And the Hebrew word for almighty or mighty one is al, which is the Hebrew letters, the aleph and the lamed. However, this was not meant to signify that our mighty one is a bull or an ox. What the aleph, letter aleph represents is the power and the strength of the beast. The Hebrew letter Lamed is a shepherd's crook. So when we put the two letters together, what we get is mighty shepherd. Describes who Yahuwah is to us. Just check out Psalms 23, verse 1. So while Yahuwah has given us these things in nature to try and teach us the relationship he wants to have with his people, Hasatan has come along to distort the meaning of these things so that the people will turn around and worship the created things instead of the creator. Sadly, being able to visualize the Almighty in the form of a calf was important to our ancestors because this visual image became something in which the people can anchor their faith. The fear that was once in their hearts is replaced with faith in this image. Now, remember that little old lady I was telling you about, my client, who pointed to the image of Jesus and said, he's not ready for me yet. 
I want you to think about this, Joshua. In the book of Hazun or Revelation chapter 13, we are told about another image there, the image of the beast. I want you to think, could there be a connection between this image and the many images we see of the false Jesus? Relying on an image to recall a concept. In science, this is something called imprinting. Hasatan keeps recycling his same tricks over and over and over again because he knows that the imprinted image and the words associated to that image will leave an indelible mark on the human mind. From the time you're a baby, this occurs. When flashcards are used, uh, you know, as if you're a parent out there, you will know what I'm talking about. You have those flashcards with a picture on it. could be a picture of a dog, of a horse, of a ball, of a fruit. And you show your baby that card, and then you say the word behind it. Well, then a connection is made, a connection that will stick with you throughout the rest of your life. And this is, the, and this is what imprinting is, because imprinted pictures control development of concepts carry throughout life. And Hasatan, the one who's deceived the entire world, he's used Christian education programs to imprint pictures in the minds of children and of new converts just when they're ready to learn the Christian concept of God. And this is done through magazines, coloring books, children's books, TV shows. And what we see is a white Jesus with long blonde or light brown hair, blue eyes. I want to say this and put this out there. I have nothing against, quote, unquote, white people. In fact, the assembly that I attend has white folks in it who I love dearly and consider to be my sisters and brothers. But what I am against is the false image of the Messiah. Research shows that imprinted concepts control and delimits the future. What this means is if you were to be shown a picture of a black Jesus or a Chinese Jesus or an East Indian Jesus, these concepts would be subconsciously rejected for the popular white Jesus with long golden locks. And even though you may verbally express with your mouth and say, yes, yep, Christ could have been a dark-skinned man, in the deep recesses of the subconscious, that imprinted concept that you saw from when you were a young child, that's the one that often sticks with you. In fact, I was speaking to a lady today who was just coming into an understanding of uh, the Hebraic roots, she was sharing with me how she was keeping the Feast of Trumpets. She said it was very hard for her to get rid of that false image of Jesus that she had been taught all those years. Now, I'm not going to go too much into the science of how this imprinting works, but I do want to give you a brief history. In 1935, a behavioral scientist by the name of Conrad Lorenz used the word imprint to refer to the rapid learning process that causes a baby chicken or a young animal to recognize its parent. The English word imprint is the translation of his German word, pragung, closely related to the English phrase to stamp in or stamping in. So imprintation in animals refers to the rapid acquisition of an animal's primary social bond to its parents. It occurs during a limited time early on in the life of an animal. Imprintation in animals forms the animal's social and affectional system. It has been called the approach and following response. In educational terms, it's been called self-reinforced learning. Because once a duckling is imprinted with the knowledge, correctly or incorrectly, of who its mother is, it needs no further reinforcement from outside. For the same reason, it is called non-reinforced learning. It needs no reinforcement to learn it. The modern church uses these pictures of Christ to give small children a concept of Christ. And the rationale behind it, well, we think in pictures. 
So we need pictures to be able to think. And this picture is given during the child's time of readiness, of learning, when they're soaking in all this new knowledge. And it answers that child's question, just who is Christ? The picture is imprinted in their mind as the answer to the child's curiosity about who Jesus is. I hope we're getting the picture, Yasharal, that from very early on, Hasatan has been playing mind games with us. The picture is shown to the child, and the parent or the teacher says, this is Jesus. The child doesn't know the difference, whether it's false or not. The child doesn't recognize this. He, he just sees the picture as his frame of reference for Christ. And it becomes Jesus to him or her, especially if it is given by a person that he or she trusts. And this is precisely why many of our Hebrew brothers and sisters end up rejecting the New Testament and the Messiah of the New Testament because this false image, this false Jesus, this modern-day golden calf, is their frame of reference. There's an old saying, it says, give a child, give us a child until he is six, and he will be ours forever. And it's just because those first six years of life is when a child, their minds are like sponges and they're just soaking everything in. And this is what's happening right now, Yashra, in Sunday schools all across America. So while small children sing the songs and hear the stories about Jesus, the teachers direct the child's inquisitive eyes to these pictures. The child's questioning mind quickly observes that when he hears the name of Christ, he should think of those pictures. And the pictures satisfy the child's curiosity and become the concept for Christ. And so the question is asked, if the true Messiah should appear at an unexpected time, will the child be able to recognize him? That's the tragedy in all of this. Because they'd be looking for their concept of Christ and they'd end up rejecting the true Messiah. Because the true Messiah didn't correspond to their substitute image or idol. A wall painting depicting the healing of the paralytic is one of the earliest known pictures of Christ, and it dates back to 235 A.D. The conventional image of a fully bearded Jesus with long flowing locks, oh, oh, I'm sorry, flowing locks, did not become established until the 6th century in Eastern Christianity. Many of us on here know already that the popular bearded image of Jesus was actually based off of a ruthless soldier named Caesar Borgia, who was the son of Pope Pius the sixth. The more popularized picture of Jesus that most of us are familiar with is called the Head of Christ. And this came out in 1941 by an artist named Warner Salmon. And if you just Google that, the Head of Christ, you'll see that image pop up and you'll automatically recognize it. I'm sure most of us have seen it. This work, believe it or not, was reproduced over 500 million times. I'll repeat, that picture alone, called the Head of Christ, was reproduced more than 500 million times. And by 1944, the market supported increasing the prints of this idolatrous picture to be used in public spaces such as churches and the YMCA. The image can be found in Bibles, greeting cards, clocks, buttons, funeral announcements. This is what one person had to say about that picture. They said, there's something about Warner Salmon's picture that made me feel that this artist had felt Christ's presence when he made the images. And you can feel Christ's presence conveyed, conveyed to you through these images. From the way the hair in the images highlighted in the back and highlights around the front of the head and face, there seems to be a holy radiance emanating from this image. Sadly, the New Age Christ, referred to as Sananda, 
If you just Google that term, Sananda, S-A-N-A-N-D-A, you'll see that it has a similar appearance to these images as well. A lily white bearded man with long flowing golden locks. Yashral, listening audience, Hasatan has his golden calf in place. The image of the beast. And we know that this imprinting, this having this image in the minds of the people, that it works because it worked once already. Need I remind you that the majority of Yasharal rejected the Messiah when he walked the earth almost 2,000 years ago. The Pharisees were not aware that their imprinted mental image of the Messiah was causing them to overlook the true Messiah that was in their presence. Maybe they had accepted that the, uh, the, the image in their mind was one of a, of a conquering king, similar to the conquering kings and gods and goddesses of the Roman Empire. And so ultimately they rejected the true Messiah when he was standing there right amongst them. They had fa- failed to read the scriptures correctly, and a wrong image of the Messiah had become imprinted in their mind. They were under Hasatan's mind control. They could not accept the fact that their mental image was wrong. And if you do the research, you'll see that many of those Pharisees were already of the synagogue of Satan. Well, history has a funny way of repeating itself. Just as most rejected him then, so will they reject him when he returns. In fact, the scriptures declare the nations will be going to war against them. In the second chapter of Psalms, that encounter is described. There it reads, Why do the nations rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel against Yahuwah and against his Mashiach, saying, Let us tear off their chains and free ourselves from their restraints. He that sits in the Shamayim shall laugh. Yahuwah shall have them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, Yet have I set my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will declare the decree. Yahuwah hath said unto me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, you kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve Yahuwah with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. Blessed are they that put Today I'm asking you, debate talk for you, audience. Where do you put your trust? Are you trusting in the true son of Allahim? Is your trust in Yahushua? Or are you still trusting in the false Jesus? Is your trust in the true Allahim of Yahshua? Or are you trusting in the modern day golden calf? This golden calf that the world has constructed and calls Jesus is a false image and has caused the majority of mankind not to worship the Father with spirit and truth, caused the world not to exercise the required faith needed to worship Yahuwah. Instead, it has caused people to rely on visible things, the things seen with the eye, golden calves as objects of worship in their affection. A clear violation of Yahuwah's second commandment found in Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. Now, how did Yahuwah feel about that idolatry that was taking place at the foot of that mountain? Well, when we read on in Exodus chapter 32, we're at verse 9. There it says, Yahuwah said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Yahuwah was ready to wipe the people of Yashrael out. 
That is how much he detests and hates the idolatrous ways of his people. In verse 11, it says, Moshe besought Yahuwah his alua and said, Yahuwah, why does thy wrath wax hot against the people which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember, Abraham, Isaac, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. In verse 14 it reads, And Yahuwah repented of the evil which he thought to do to his people. Here we see Moses acting as an intercessor for the people. Some will say that Moses had to change Yahuwah's mind. But that's not what was happening here. What Yahuwah was demonstrating to us is the type of leader that Moses was. You see, Yahuwah already knew in his foreknowledge how Moses was going to respond. He was showing us why he chose Moses. Because most of us, most people, if they were placed in that same position, they would have agreed and said, yes, let the people out. Let's start all over. But Moses had the heart of a true servant. He was a type and shadow of Yahushua, our Messiah. He was a very humble man. And just like Messiah is our intercessor, so Moses was interceding on behalf of the children of Yahshua'el. We read on in verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other they were written. And the tables were the work of Allahim. And the writing was the writing of Allahim, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua or Yahushua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome but the noise of them that sing is what I hear now let's stop there before they physically saw what was going on in the camp their ears heard singing I can remember speaking to a Hebrew brother who said the hardest part for him when leaving the Christian church was leaving the singing and the music. He loved to listen to the choir. Another brother I can recall that called into this very show and shared his testimony. He said that he grew up as a musician in the church and it had become his livelihood. But when his eyes were open to the idolatry in the church and he even testified that when he learned about the false name of Jesus, he had to leave the church. And this was a brother that had a young baby, young family. But he left the church. You see, audience, the singing in church, whether we're talking about a predominantly black church, it could be a white church, Asian, Hispanic, it doesn't matter. This is what highly influences the people to come week after week. Because the music is what appeases the flesh. I'll repeat. The music appeases the flesh. Hasatan knows how to produce good music, Yashmael, both gospel and secular. He's got both those bases covered. And it is the music, the energy that it produces, the positive vibes and feelings that it produces, which is why many remain stuck in mystery Babylon and refuse to come out. Singing, dancing, and general celebration is connected to idolatry. Which is why so many will find it easy to go from the club on Saturday night and slide right up into the church on Sunday morning. From the party dress to Sunday's best. From 50 Cent to Kirk Franklin. It's the same spirit at work, just different places. Just like that lady I was telling you about that went from the Catholic church 
into the non-denominational church. Different places, but the same heart and same spirit at work. We read on in Shemot, or Exodus chapter 32, verse 19. And it came to pass, as soon as he came near unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moshe's anger waxed hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hand and broke them beneath the mountain. Isn't it, isn't it sad, Yashrael, that at the foot of this mountain where the children of Yashrael made their vows to Yahuwah, this is the same place where Moshe, in his anger, cast down the tablets of stone, and they broke. You see, Moses now had a chance to see with his very own eyes what Yahuwah already saw. And now Moses realizes why Yahuwah was so angry with the people. What was taking place here was a mix of a Pentecostal service and Woodstock. And for some of you younger listeners out there, just Google Woodstock and you'll see what was taking place back in the 1960s. Verse 20, And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water. And he made the children of Israel drink of it. Now, this verse puzzles many people because many people wonder why in the world would Moses force the children of Israel to drink of the ashes of the golden calf? We're going to look very quickly in Numbers chapter 5. Turn with me to the book of Numbers chapter 5. Here we see the test of the unfaithful wife, also called the Torah or the law of jealousy. And in the interest of time, we're going to start at verse 11. There it says, Yahuwah said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, If a man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him, so that another man has sexual relations with her, and this is hidden from her husband, and her impurity is undetected, since there is no witness against her, and since she has not been caught in the act, and if feelings of jealousy come over her husband, and he suspects his wife, and she is impure, or if he is jealous and suspects her, even though she is not impure, then he is to take his wife to the priest. He must also take an offering of a tenth of an ephah, of barley flour on her behalf. He must not pour olive oil on it or put incense on it, because it is a grain offering of, for jealousy, a reminder offering to draw attention to wrongdoing. Verse 16, the priest shall bring her and have her stand before Yahuwah. Then he shall take some Kodesh water in a clay jar and put some dust from the tabernacle floor into the water. And the priest has had, and the, I'm sorry, after the priest has had the woman stand before Yahuwah, he shall uncover the woman's head and place in her hands the reminder offering, the grain offering for jealousy, while he himself holds the bitter water that brings the curse. Then the priest shall put the woman under oath and say to her, if no other man has had sexual relations with you, and you have not gone astray and become impure while married to your husband, may this bitter water that brings a curse not harm you. But if you have gone astray while married to your husband, and you have made yourself impure by having sexual relations with a man other than your husband, here the priest is to put the woman under this curse. May Yahuwah cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your thigh waste away and your abdomen swell. May this water that brings the curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells and your thigh wastes away. Then the woman is to say, Amen, so be it. Verse 23. The priest is to write these curses on a scroll and then wash them off into the bitter water. He shall make the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse. And this water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering will enter her. The priest is to take from her hands the green offering for jealousy. Wave it before Yahuwah and bring it to the altar. The priest is then to take a handful of the grain offering as a memorial offering and burn it on the altar. After that, he is to have the woman drink the water. If she has made herself impure and been unfaithful to her husband, this will be the result. When she is made to drink the water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering, it will enter her. Her abdomen will swell and her thighs shall waste away and she'll become a curse. If, however, the woman has not made herself impure, but is clean, she will be cleared of guilt and will be able to have children. 
This then is the law of jealousy. When, when a woman goes astray and makes herself impure while married to her, her husband, or when feelings of jealousy come over a man because he suspects his wife, the priest is to have her stand before Yahuwah and is to apply this entire Torah or law to her. The husband will be innocent of any wrongdoing, but the woman will bear the consequences of her sin. Like this unfaithful wife, the children of Israel had gone astray. They turned out of the way of truth and life and into the way of lies and death. They drank of this cup, which on a mystery level represents the cup of Yahuwah's wrath. And now as a nation, they were getting ready to pay the consequence. When we read on in Exodus chapter 32, in verse 25, there it reads, And when Moses, or Moshe, saw the people, they were naked. The Hebrew word for naked is para, and it can also signify being without a covering. Brothers and sisters, Yahushua HaMashiach is our covering. In the Renewed Covenant writings in the book of Romans, chapter 13, verse 14, we are told to put on the Yahushua HaMashiach and make no provisions to fulfill the fleshy lust. Many Muslims will go into the mosque on Friday evening, all dressed up. Many Adventists and Jews go to their respective places of worship on the Sabbath, on Saturday. And many Christians go into the church on Sunday morning, all dressed up. But spiritually, they are naked because they have not put on the Mashiach and they're relying on a false covering and as a result are practicing spiritual adultery, which is what idolatry represents, spiritual adultery. Yahuwah's desire for us is to have an intimate and close connection to him which is why he likens his relationship with us as to a marriage covenant. He desires that level of closeness. And yet, we have Hebrews out there that will tell you that his name doesn't matter. They'll say knowing his name doesn't matter. It's all about knowing his character. I ask you, Yashua, how crazy is that? Husbands, can you imagine your wife saying your name doesn't matter and calling you by a different name? Perhaps she wants to call you by the name of an old boyfriend. Wives, can you imagine your husband saying your name doesn't matter and calling you by a different name? Perhaps he wants to call you by the name of his old flame. I can tell you right now that would not go over well in your household. But when it comes to the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who keeps our hearts beating and puts breath into our lungs, we have the audacity to stretch our vocal cords and say to the world, his name doesn't matter. The next thing Moses did represents what Yahushua, the true Messiah of Yahshua, is going to do when he returns to this earth. A clear line will be drawn in the sand. We read this in verse 26. There it says, Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on Yahuwah's side? Let him come unto me. And as, as I said earlier, we can see that Moses represents a type and shadow of the Messiah because the Messiah also said those three words, come unto me. In the book of Matthew, or Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The call was made by the Mashiach for those that labor to come unto him. In another scripture it says that the harvest is ripe but the laborers are few. Those that labor are those that are doing the kingdom work. Witnessing. Giving out scriptures. Feeding the hungry. Looking after the needs of the homeless. The orphan and the widow. It could be making videos to teach and warn others. Those that are heavy laden represent his people that are being oppressed 
whether oppressed with physical ailments, oppressed by racism, false imprisonment, oppressed by ruling powers that be. They have all these burdens in this life. But Yahushua was calling them into his rest. Yahushua was calling them to his side. Just like we see here, Moses, Moshe was calling them to stand with him. That stand with Yahuwah. And we see the true laborers, the sons of Levi or Louis. They came to Moses. They, they answered that call. And when we look up Levi's name in Hebrew, it means joined or attached. The sons of Levi or Louis were showing they were joined to Yahuwah. I ask you, debate talks to you, audience. Are you joined to Yahuwah? Are you a true laborer in our master's vineyard? Or are you standing by the sidelines just watching the action? I hear the excuses already. Brother Jason, I love Yah, but I have these bills to pay and I have to work 50 or 60 hours a week. Or I'm in college and I have all this schoolwork to do. Then I'll tell you this, you've become attached to the things of this world and the cares of this life. Don't get me wrong, Yashua. I'm not telling you to quit school or your job or to stop paying your bills. I'm saying the work of Yahuwah must come first and foremost in your life. The energy you dedicate to work and school, well, you should dedicate twice, if not three times as much more toward Yahuwah's work. Now I want you to imagine this. If every believer did just that, the true name and Yahuwah's Torah, would spread like wildfire across the earth. Obeying his commands must come first and foremost in your life. If your job encroaches on your ability to honor Yahuwah's Sabbath and observe Yahuwah's feasts, I'll tell you this, if your job won't make concessions for you, then you've got to quit that job. Because this is how we set Yahuwah apart. This is how we show the world that Yahuwah is the Elohim of our lives and the true and living Elohim, when we make a stand for him and put our implicit trust in him. Check out his promise. He says, come unto me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Don't you want to exchange that hard yoke of bondage the world and Hasatan has you under? Don't you want to exchange that heavy load and burden for a light one? This is what Yahushua is offering. But it's so sad that very few take him up on that offer and would rather remain slaves to this world system. Now, once the, the, the line is drawn in the sand and we see that the sons of Levi heeded the call and stood with Moses, we see that it was time for Yahuwah to execute his judgment. Yashra, you can't get caught up in blatant idolatry, remain unrepentant about it and expect to get away with it. And yet we have so many in this world going to church, singing their songs to Jesus each and every week, thinking that same thing, I'm saved by grace, which incidentally is another name for a pagan goddess. They'll say, Jesus paid it all. And they go about their filthy lives as soon as they leave the church property. Some commit their lewd acts right there on the church property. And somehow they think they're going to get away with it. But I'm here to tell you that Yahuwah is an Elohim of justice. And these next few verses are just a small example of the justice that is going to be executed throughout the earth. In Exodus 32, verse 27, it says, And he said unto them, Thus said Yahuwah Elohim of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his neighbor, and every man his companion." And every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. 3,000 souls perished. And this no doubt represented the unrepentant people who are most likely the leaders of the idolatry. And an amazing thing happens in these following verses. We see Moses return up into the mount and an attempt to make atonement for Israel's sin. He even offers to be blotted out of the book or the scroll of life. 
for the sake of the people. In verse 30, it says, And it came to pass in the morning that Moses said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto Yahuwah. Perhaps I can make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto Yahuwah and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them an Elohim of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book or the scroll which you have written. And Yahuwah said unto Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore now go, lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my messenger shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And Yahuwah plagued the people, because they made the calf, which Aaron made. What these verses demonstrate to us are several things. One, Moses could not be the atoning sacrifice for the people's sin. The second thing it shows us is that unlike the leaders of their insurrection, those that lost their lives, the children of Israel that remained alive, they still had to pay the consequences for their sin. Let this be a warning to those of you out there that think you're getting away with the dirt. You aren't getting away. A plague is coming. And thirdly, though Moses was commanded to lead the people, he was reminded that one was going before him. Now, most Bibles will say it was an angel. And this is where having an understanding of our Hebrew culture is vital, Yashuael. Because as the children of Yashuael, the word there in the Hebrew is Malak. Malak is better translated as messenger. And in that Hebrew word Malak, we have the Mem, the Lamed, and the Ka. And we find the letter Lamed, which I mentioned earlier in the study, symbolized in the Hebrew pictograph as a shepherd's crook. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, we are getting an amazing revelation of just who this Malak or messenger is. It is the great shepherd, Yahushua, or Messiah. So what Yahuwah was saying to Moses was this. Yes, I've called you to lead the people, but you must follow the one who is leading you. And the Apostle Shaul, or Paul, puts it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Follow me, just as I follow Messiah. The one who leads the way, which is Yahushua the Messiah, would be the one who makes atonement for Yashorel. Hallelujah. We're winding down. Now, sadly, this golden calf, it keeps resurfacing throughout our history, Yashorel. We read in the book of Kings, 1 Kings chapter 12, about the pair of golden calves that were made by Israel's King Jeroboam. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 12. In the interest of time, we're just going to start at verse 25. There it says, And Jeroboam, or better pronounced Jeroboam, built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. And he went out from there and built Benuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the rain shall return to the house of Dawid if these people go up to do slaughterings or sacrifice in the house of Yahuwah at Yerushalayim. Then the heart of this people shall turn back to their master, Rehoboam, sovereign of Yehuda, And they shall slay me and go back to Rehoboam, sovereign of Yehuda. So the sovereign took counsel, and he made two calves of gold, and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Yerushalayim. See your mighty ones, O Yashua, which brought you up from the land of Mitzrayim. And he set up one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. And this matter became a sin. For the people went before the one as far as Dan. And he made the house of high places and made priests from all sorts of people who were not the sons of Louis. And Jeroboam performed a festival on the 15th day of the eighth month, like the festival that was in Yehuda. And he offered on the altar. So he did at Bethel, slaughtering to the calves that he made. And at Bethel he appointed the priests of the high places which he had made. And he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel, 
on the fifteenth day of the eighth month in the month which he had in the month which he had devised in his own heart. We see that this wicked king, Jeroboam or Jeroboam, he devised a plan so that the children of Israel would not return to the city of David, that they would not return to Jerusalem. Because as part of the command in Torah, during the fall feast, they were to return to Jerusalem. And this king feared that he would lose his new kingdom and control of the ten northern tribes if they returned to the city of Dawid. So Jeroboam stopped the ten tribes from going back to the temple to worship by persuading them to stay and worship inside the borders of their own land. So Hasatan used Jeroboam to reintroduce golden calf worship. And along with that worship came alternative places of worship. They worshipped at Dan and Bethel in the temples that were there. And along with these two sites, there was a false in which they were to worship. And instead of the Levitical priesthood, Jeroboam introduced his own priesthood. And the text says all of this was devised in his own heart. Well, as I repeated throughout this lesson, the same thing is happening today, Yashrael. Hasatan has his Jeroboams out there running wild. And he's accomplished his goals through mainly the Roman Catholic Church, who have introduced this golden calf worship on a worldwide scale. And the only difference is, is this golden calf is a golden-haired image of a false messiah named Jesus Christ. And they have introduced false priests and pastors, false places of worship called the church. They have introduced false feast days, Christmas, Easter, so that the children of Israel will not return to Torah. They will not return to the true feast found in Leviticus 23. And ultimately, they will miss their appointments with Almighty Yah. I remind you that the golden calves serve the same function as do the pictures today that represent the Messiah. The images answer the question, what is Israel's Almighty One like? A question that was in the minds of the Gentile nations surrounding Israel. And the image became the answer. How does Yahuwah feel about this? Turn with me into the book of Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter 46. And we're just going to read the nine verses there. Yeshayahu, or Isaiah 46, 1 through 9. There it says, Bel has bowed down. Nebo is stooping. These are the idols. It says, their idols were on the beasts and on the cattle. That which is carried is burdensome, a burden to the weary. They have stooped. They have bowed down together. They were unable to deliver the burden, but they themselves went into captivity. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Yashorel, who are born from the belly, who are carried from the womb. Even to your old age, I am he. And even to gray hairs, I carry. I have made, and I bear, and I carry, and I rescue. To whom do you liken me and compare me and make me similar that we should be alike? They pour gold out of the bag and weigh silver on the scale. They hire a gold to the mighty one. They fall down. They also bow themselves. They bear it on the shoulder. They carry it and set it in its place and it stands. From its place, it does not move. Though one cries out to it, it does not answer, nor save him from his distress. Remember this and show yourselves men. Turn it back, your transgressors. You transgressors. Remember the former events of old. For I am Al, and there is no one else. Elohim, and there is no one like me. Remembering the former events of old is what we're doing here tonight. We are seeing that Yahuwah, that he is set apart, Yashuael. And there is no one like him. No one. We're going to conclude now. You remember that Moshe, or Moses, made the children of Israel drink from that cup, which on a mystery level represents the wrath of Almighty Yahuwah. 
Well, I'm here to tell you that each and every one of us deserve to drink of that cup. Each and every one of us has been a, an adulterous bride on some level. And if you're still stuck up in Christianity with its Jesus worship, it, then you are still dancing around that golden calf and caught up in spiritual adultery. If you're in some other religion like Islam, Buddhism, Taoism, Rastafarianism, Judaism, New Ageism, then you are an adulterous bride. You may be listening tonight, and you may not be religious at all, but if you have a love of money, material things, your job, if you worship your husband, your wife, your kids, guess what? You are an adulterous bride. Because as human beings, we were designed to worship and set our adoration on the Most High. So if something else is getting that worship and adoration before him, you are engaged in idolatry, and you deserve to drink from that cup of the wrath of Elohim. You deserve the penalty of your sin, which when we read about that Torah of jealousy, we see that bride would suffer a swollen abdomen and a rotting thigh, which are both symbolic of spiritual decay and death. But guess what? One night, almost 2,000 years ago, something amazing happened. We read about it in the book of Matthew, Yahu or Matthew chapter 26. There it says, Then Yahushua came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to the top ones, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Kepha and the two sons of Zabdi. And he began to be grieved and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My being is exceedingly grieved even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And going forward a little, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will, but thine be done. And he came to the top ones and found them asleep. And he said to Keith, So were you not able to watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray. Enter into trial. The spirit indeed is eager but the flesh is weak. Did you notice the words of Yahushua? He said, Father, let this cup pass from me. Yahshua, please understand. Yahushua, our Messiah, took that cup, which represented the cup of Yahuwah's wrath, and he drank of that cup so that we didn't have to. That Torah of jealousy. Because Yahuwah is a jealous owl. So Yahushua took the price for the adulterous bride. Which is why he died on that torture stake. Which was summed up in his words. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And we notice that when Yahushua returned, he found that his disciples, the Talmudim, were asleep. Many are still asleep. It's my prayer for you, the audience, that you out there are waking up and that you will strive to live a set-apart lifestyle and that you will set Yahuwah the Father and Yahushua the Son apart and that there will be no more golden calves in your lives. Like Yahushua warned his disciples, I'll give the warning to Yahshua tonight. In this late hour, now is not the time to sleep. You need to watch and pray. With that, I'll conclude this lesson.